An elderly widow is brutally murdered in her home. This was uh, an absolute senseless crime. Police have little evidence and no one's talking. There were so many people who were afraid that the killer or killers were still in the community. But a psychic has disturbing visions of the crime. She had been stabbed so many times. Can a psychic's insights solve the mystery of who killed Rose Swartwood? Myra, New York, an historic town of clapboard houses and white picket fences. A town Huckleberry Finn author Mark Twain once called home. A town unaccustomed to crime. But not on August 25th, 1988. On that day, 74-year-old Rose Swartwood, widowed and living alone, is found dead in her apartment. She'd been the victim of a shocking attack beaten, bitten, and stabbed to death. I think the nature of the crime, being a, uh, an elderly woman that lived alone, um, was very upsetting. It caught a lot of the media attention and, and upset a lot of the people in the community. I mean, it was a, a terrible, heinous crime. Mike Moosey from the local sheriff's office and Corky Patterson from the Elmira Police Department are assigned to investigate this gruesome case. Yeah, there hadn't been a murder in Elmira in several years. Jim Pfeiffer is a journalist who covered the story. What bothered people the most, I thought, was this is a, a woman who's innocent, who has no enemies. It could happen to me. You know, this, it isn't supposed to happen to anyone, but especially to people like this. It was believed from the very beginning of this investigation that it was a possibly a burglary gone to a homicide rather than a planned homicide. We, I think we felt quite strongly that this was not anticipated to be a homicide from the beginning, but more a burglary gone bad and once confronted, turned into a, a, a terrible homicide. Moosey and Patterson face major problems. Despite the apparent frenzy of the murder, little forensic evidence was left behind by Rose's killers. The crime scene was very cleaned up. There were some things disturbed still when the police arrived there, but it had actually, it appeared they had scrubbed down the walls and the floors with some type of cleaning agent. Not only this, but locals are reluctant to talk. A lot of times people just would clam up and they give them false information. So it making it more difficult for the police who in this community were used to quickly solving a crime. Rose lived in one of Elmira's tougher neighborhoods, the Hawthorne Court housing project. Oh, I believe there were people that, that felt they would be threatened if they cooperated with the police. Scores of potential suspects are interviewed and eliminated. Only two rise to the top of the list. William Cuddy and Demetrius Moore, both local, both well-known to police. We were relatively certain uh, the, who these suspects were and what their involvement in the crime was. With little evidence to tie Cuddy and Moore to the crime scene and no witnesses prepared to come forward, the investigation gradually stalls. There were so many people who were afraid that the killer or killers were still in the community police being blamed for not doing a good job, when that wasn't th the case. They were doing a good job. They just couldn't get a lot of cooperation, a lot of information. Months pass with no new leads. The case grows cold. But detectives Moosey and Patterson don't give up. They're not about to let Rose Swartwood's killers away with murder. Two years after her homicide, with nothing to lose, Detective Moosey decides to try something very different. He decides to enlist a psychic. I had heard about Phil Jordan from, an, from other law enforcement agencies. I had never been to him before. Um, the Sheriff's Department had never used him before. To my knowledge, no other agency in this county had used him before. Um, I spoke to Sergeant Patterson about it. We discussed it. We figured there was nothing to lose. Phil Jordan is one of America's best known psychics with a strong track record of helping cops solve difficult crimes. I have been working with the police for the past 35 years. Jordan uses photographs to make a psychic connection to crime scenes. When I work on a case, I will take a picture of the victim. And as I look at that picture, I start seeing things about that person. Detectives decide to tell Jordan nothing about Rose Swartwood or her murder. When Cork and Mike came to the first meeting, they brought a picture of Rose Swartwood with them. And I looked at that picture and did a reading. 
Right away, Jordan surprises the police. The perpetrators, I felt, came into the dwelling believing they were going to do a burglary, and they were surprised to find that there was a person in the house. And um, then I feel as though both the perpetrators felt as though the whole situation went completely wrong, that they had gotten much more involved than they wanted to in the crime itself. Jordan claims his visions reveal not only what happened during the crime, but also what the killers did after. Then I felt as though they would put things, try to put things back the way they had found it. Again, the cops are surprised. Jordan has just identified the reason their investigation has so little physical evidence. But the big question is, can he tell them who killed Rose Swartwood? To find out, they hand him a stack of photos. I took probably between 50 and 75 mugshots of various people um, to see if any of them had any significance to him whatsoever. Uh, we had pictures of people who had been suspects but ruled out, and we had pictures of people who we didn't think had any involvement whatsoever. No names on any of the photographs or anything. Just quietly, we sat there for approximately uh, 10 or 15 minutes as he flipped through several mugshots. And I noticed, uh, as did Sergeant Patterson, he pulled out a picture of Bill Cuddy and set it aside. Uh, he then continued to uh, flip through the photographs, and probably 20 or 30 photographs later, he pulled a mugshot of Demetrius Moore, and he laid that uh, down. I felt one of the perpetrators would be black and one of them would be white. It was a moment that would change the course of a two-year investigation. When he pulled those two pictures out and set them aside, I was trying my best not to look at uh, Sergeant Patterson, but he had pulled out our two prime suspects. With no prior knowledge, how could the psychic have zeroed in on the two prime suspects? Just about everything that he described was pretty much on the money. But can a psychic's dark visions help police find justice for Rose Swartwood? For two years, Elmira, New York area detectives Mike Moosey and Corky Patterson have been hunting the vicious killer of an elderly widow. It's very unusual for us to have a crime like that. It was extremely, uh, extremely rare here. With little evidence and no witnesses, the police investigation had hit a wall until a psychic identifies the two prime suspects, suspects who, up to now, detectives haven't had the evidence to arrest. When he completed going through all the photographs, he put the rest of them down and said that he felt that the two that he had pulled out, that being the photographs of Demetrius Moore and William Cuddy, were in fact the two people that he felt were directly involved in the crime of the death of Rose Horwood. William Cuddy is a name very familiar to Elmira police. Cuddy was doing time, uh, he pled guilty in June of 89 to the sexual abuse charge that I had originally investigated him on. And I think he caught a one and a half to four year bid. So he was at that time in KU at Correctional Facility. William Cuddy was a suspect because a jailhouse informant had contacted Detective Moosey saying Cuddy had been bragging in jail about killing Rose. But when the detective tried to question Cuddy, the prisoner wouldn't talk. He had a, um, an incredible loss of memory. Uh, he did not wish to remember any of the details and immediately posed a problem for us. Demetrius Moore is another story. Demetrius Moore was actually a neighbor of the victim and um, was questioned along with several other people as a potential suspect. Moore has remained a suspect because he had a motive. He blamed Rose and her complaints about his loud music for his eviction from oh, Hawthorne please. Court. In fact, a few weeks prior to her death, uh, some obscenities were uh, written on her back door, uh, which later during the investigation was alleged that Demetrius was the one that was responsible for putting those obscenities on the back door. People in the neighborhood are afraid of Demetrius Moore. Rumors on the street say he is linked to the criminal underworld. His reputation has been a major stumbling block to the investigation. Demetrius was free and on the street, and which was another thing that hampered some people wanting to cooperate with us. 
By pulling the two mugshots, Phil Jordan has confirmed the suspicions of the detectives. Now the psychic has a vision of the actual crime. Whenever I work a case, I not only try to discover how the person may have died, but I also try to figure out what the injuries were inflicted with. In this case, I felt as though she was stabbed, and I could feel that there'd be a rather long knife that was used. Ultimately, there were several stab wounds, uh, which Ms. Swartwood suffered as a result of this, uh, this crime. If one was to read the autopsy report, they'd understand that Mr. Jordan's descriptions were quite correct. The psychic also claims he can see which of the two suspects actually stabbed Rose. Phil described to us that the person who did the actual slaying, the actual killing itself, would have a uh, tattoo on their shoulder. I noticed a marking on his arm that would be a tattoo, and I felt that it had a woman's name in it, but I couldn't make out the woman's name. I knew that Cuddy had such a tattoo on his left shoulder. Mike was not aware of it. No one else connected with the case was aware of it. And that he was the, the perpetrator, the assailant that killed Rose Swartwood. The tattoo is a stunning revelation, one that Jordan had no way of knowing. Yeah, he, he was able to describe Mr. Cuddy as being a vicious uh, person, a person who hated women, had a, a deep hatred for women. I'm working a case. Some of the things I see may seem trivial or ridiculous to the investigation, but may prove to be very significant. I felt that out of her own nature, her own character, and her own nervousness, she would twirl this ring on her finger with her thumb. And there was something about the ring. It was a very large ring and a high set ring. And there's something that just, that whole situation caught my eye. And so I asked them about the ring, and they didn't know anything about it. Subsequent to that, we interviewed uh, Rose, Rose's sister. And we asked about jewelry in general, whether she wore it, whether she had a lot of it. Um, her sister had told us that uh, she did wear a cocktail ring on her ring finger and then uh, proceeded to tell us that uh, she twirled it with her thumb repeatedly. And um, I mean, that is information that certainly neither one of us knew. After two frustrating years, Detectives Moosey and Patterson's visit to Phil Jordan re-energizes the case. More than ever, they believe Demetrius Moore and William Cuddy are responsible for the death of Rose Swartwood. We left there with some pretty surprising uh, feelings that he had told us things about Cuddy that probably not a lot of people had known or even investigated. But now the police must prove that Cuddy and Moore are the killers, and it's not going to be easy. So we continued to build the case, and we weren't going to jump before we had all the evidence we could collect and all the information that we needed. A major difficulty has been placing Cuddy and Moore at the crime scene. The detectives revisit the forensic evidence. There was a, a sample of blood that was found at the point of entry, uh, which is a rear door, a, a small broken window. The drop of blood doesn't match the DNA of either Rose Swartwood or William Cuddy, but trying to match it to Demetrius Moore has stymied the police. You would have to apply for a court order. And in this case, in order to get a court order, you would at least need enough evidence to substantiate that this person was a viable suspect. Initially, we didn't feel we, we had enough evidence to do that. The other piece of forensic evidence comes from the victim's body, bite marks. In the struggle before she died, Rose Swartwood was bitten on the shoulder. Bite marks are, are very difficult uh, to identify most of the time, especially when the victim is, is the uh, receiver of the bite mark. Though the psychic and the cops both believe William Cuddy stabbed Rose, the investigators don't believe he bit her, and for good reason. Mr. Cuddy uh, wore dentures, and it was clear that the person who did the biting didn't wear dentures. If Moore and Cuddy were accomplices in the murder, Moore must be the one who did the biting. Uh, there was actually a photograph taken of Demetrius Moore's teeth on the day of the homicide. When he was being interviewed, the detectives um, thought enough and were smart enough to take a uh, voluntary picture of his teeth. 
Demetrius Moore's teeth may be the key to solving the murder mystery, but he's about to do something no one could ever imagine. For two years, detectives Mike Moosey and Corky Patterson have been investigating the murder of elderly widow Rose Swartwood. This was uh, an absolute senseless crime from the very beginning. Psychic Phil Jordan has identified the two prime suspects, Demetrius Moore and William Cuddy. At the time of the incident, I believe that I felt one of the perpetrators would be black and one of them would be white. Detectives have only two significant pieces of evidence a single drop of blood and bite marks found on the victim. Police believe the bite marks belong to Demetrius Moore, but before they can prove it, Moore does something very strange. The unique thing there was it was found that Demetrius had filed his teeth. Using a chisel, incredibly, Moore files down his own teeth. What's worse for detectives, they're still unable to obtain a warrant to test Moore's DNA or, indeed, make a mold of his now damaged teeth. Frustrated, the detectives return to Phil Jordan. What they really want to know is what connects their two prime suspects. There was no information or anyone had never come forward to put those two together at any, at any given time. Again, the psychic, who has been told nothing about the case, amazes the detectives. He confirms their belief that Cuddy and Moore were together at a party the night Rose was killed. I felt as I observed the party, it would be a party I would not want to go to because I know I would feel uncomfortable by the character of people that were there. I could see that it was people having a good time, but yet uh, more for the sake of partying to probably drink and get high. The party is crucial to the investigation. It's the potential link that puts Cuddy and Moore together the night of the murder. When we learned about the party initially, occurring the night of the, the homicide, uh, it was very difficult for us to get people at the party to remember who came, who left, who was there, who came with who. So locating people that were at the party for additional information on these two or anyone else that might have been with them was very difficult for, for a period of time. I remember very distinctly seeing the house where I felt that the party had taken place, that there would have to be an enclosed stairwell going up the outside of the house. He felt that the house was, um, I believe he said, green in color and had a very distinct outside staircase, which led to a second floor, which Sergeant Patterson and I knew to be the location of the party house. I felt as though they would be first at the party, they would leave the party, commit this heinous act, and then go back to the party, which showed me they probably had little conscience. Is Jordan's paranormal vision correct? Armed with these new details of the party provided by the psychic's vision, the detectives find more witnesses who were there that night, and now, two years later, several agree to talk. We did have people that came forward, you know, finally, and, and did remember Cuddy coming with Demetrius Moore. Yes, that, that link was finally made through additional witnesses. Those witnesses now paint a startling portrait of Moore and Cuddy's behavior the night of the murder. Demetrius and Cuddy left the party to supposedly go get uh, some beer and, and, and money for beer and drugs or whatever. And that they, when they returned, Cuddy had a lot of blood on him. Demetrius had a small amount on him and there was some argument out on the porch, and I believe uh, Demetrius was saying something like, you, you didn't have to kill her like that. Once again, Phil Jordan was right. Demetrius Moore and William Cuddy were together the night Rose Swartwood was killed. Finally, police have the link that puts their suspects together the night of the crime. They can now get the court order to compare Moore's DNA with that single drop of blood found at the crime scene. We certainly felt confident that there would be uh, a match or at least a grouping that was consistent with, uh, with, you know, which would be sound evidence against him being at the scene of the crime, which, which he had denied, you know, for years at this point. Demetrius Moore's DNA matches the blood found on Rose Swartwood's broken window. Moore and Cuddy are charged with the first degree murder of Rose Swartwood. At the trial, Moore challenges one of the key pieces of evidence against him that he filed down his teeth. The most unusual 
thing I ever saw on a witness stand. His excuse was when he took the stand, his teeth were chipped up like that because he opened beer bottles with his teeth. And he opened up two beer bottles on the stand. His lawyer wanted to show the jury on the stand. What it didn't do is alter the pattern of his teeth. Um, it, certainly, it certainly altered the ridges of the teeth. So they couldn't match the bite marks exactly. It didn't do him any good to, to file his teeth. Evidence at the trial showed Demetrius Moore and William Cuddy met at the party house. When they ran out of drugs and alcohol, Moore suggested they rob Rose. Unfortunately, she had returned home that evening and uh, was found in the apartment. Uh, she was, had apparently been getting ready for bed or just going to bed uh, when, the, uh, when the entry was made. The robbers surprised Rose. There was a struggle. Moore bit the elderly defenseless victim on the shoulder. Then William Cuddy began to stab her, and he stabbed her over 40 times. After killing Rose Swartwood, Cuddy and Moore dragged her body to her bed, and before leaving, they methodically washed the blood from the floor and the walls, missing just a single drop. Demetrius Moore and William Cuddy are both found guilty, and both men are sentenced to 25 years. I can't speak for the jury, so I don't know if it, if it had an impact on the jury or on the trial. Uh, it had an impact on me that, I mean, that someone could not only brutally murder a, a 72 or 74-year-old woman this way, but then stay around and clean it up afterwards. I mean, they have to have no remorse, no conscience. Today, the detectives are still amazed at the accuracy of Phil Jordan's visions. The psychic pulled William Cuddy and Demetrius Moore's photo from a stack of mugshots and identified Cuddy as the killer by a tattoo on his shoulder. Phil described the attack as a robbery gone bad and the party house where Cuddy and Moore hatched their plan. A good psychic can provide you with, with leads or something or, or an avenue to go on when you, when you don't have any. Don't rely too heavy on information that cannot be substantiated, but certainly if you've done your investigation and, I mean, uh, he's, he's done some pretty amazing things. They, they wanted to resolve the case for the family and for Rose, but they also wanted the community to be safe.